welcome to the For You podcast, where we continue the conversation about the goings-on here at Fellowship Chapel. We are a church strategically located in the heart of Macomb County, right at the border of Sterling Heights and Warren. So we are for the world, we are for Macomb, and we are for you. And welcome to a very special Christmas episode. Hey, it's Christmas. Woo-hoo! We can sing Christmas carols. I'm your host, Andrew. I am joined by our lead pastor, Robert Wendt. Hey, good to be back. And then behind the camera, we have Michael Kylo Rents, who makes sure we look good and sound good because nothing ever, ever goes wrong. All right, so today it is our very, very special Christmas edition of the For You podcast. So we're really excited about today. So the main question we have, because we've been doing research on this, and we're going to have a little bit of fun here today. We've been searching, researching the history of Christmas. So here is the big question. Today, is Christmas more of a commercial social holiday or is it primarily a Christian holiday? How should we view it today? Ooh, you know, we just did the Halloween episode not yep. too long ago. And that's quickly approaching Christmas, right? It's now the number two. Christmas is still the number one. Number one holiday. And even uh, now we're starting to see all the other religions kind of have their place in it. It's now Happy Holidays a lot more than it was Merry Christmas. Because there's also um, Hanukkah. Yep. I, I was just at Target the other day. I know. Target. Some people might be shocked. You're such a Carry on. Carry on. Anyways, I was at the Red Circle store, okay, and uh, you know, with the dog and the bullseye. Yep. And they had a big Hanukkah display, and I was like, I have not noticed that yet at a store, and so they had a Hanukkah one. So I think we have holidays coming up. There's a lot of. Different Is it ones. Kwanzaa? Does that also fall around Christmas time? I believe that does as well. Yeah. We have a Google search. All right, continue on. I get a sidetrack. So. Anyways, there's that big debate. Is it a secular holiday? Is it a religious holiday? I would say it's yes. It's oh, both, right? chicken. Come on. I we know. have to be hot takes here on this podcast so, to get the clicks. Yeah, exactly. So we have the place where y- you can see billboards. There's actually some around our area that say, put the Christ back in Christmas. Have you heard that before? Yes, I've heard that. And so there's those who are fighting for the Christian element of Christmas, but uh, everyone I know, at least in my circles, whether they are Christian or not, in some regard, celebrate Christmas. So I'd say we all have some sort of view of Christmas. Uh, what our view is can all kind of depend. Very cool. All right. So now there are so many traditions. I mean, obviously, if we take the commercial end of Christmas, mm-hmm. you know, we've got the Christmas trees, we've got the mistletoe, you've got the wreaths, the giving of the gifts. You don't have- don't forget about Elf on the Shelf. Elf on the Shelf, which is, it's a real thing, kids. It's real. Um, And then you've also got Santa Claus, so which always brings up the arc. And then, of course, you have those awkward moments where you've got the little baby Jesus manger, and they have Santa Claus there at the manger doing that. So, Or how about the one where Santa is, like, bowing down before baby Jesus? Have you seen those ones? That's kind of cringy. That's kind of cringy. Sorry if you have one of those in your home. We do appreciate the sentiment of that. And we do appreciate the fact that you are putting Jesus first. Got that disclaimer out of there. Gotcha. All right, so let's have a little bit of fun here. We've done a little bit of research here on what are some of the ancient roots of Christmas. Because a lot of people like to throw uh, Christmas under the bus saying, it's oh, it's all just the pagan holidays that the Christians co-opted to make everybody turn to, to Jesus. So we've seen some of that. Robert, what are the greatest hits that you've seen from your research on it? You know, I it was kind of fun to go down this like little rabbit trail of research on yep. it because uh, I've always, you know, through seminary and all my training, I've never actually had a discussion on the roots of Christmas. It's just something you kind of celebrate. It's mm-hmm. just always been there. You're like, oh, Jesus was born. Uh, it's in the Gospels. Yep, yeah, uh, let's move on. And I've never really kind of dove into it really that much. And so I have always just been under the impression it was a Roman holiday. It was a pagan holiday. The Christians, as the Christian church was growing, they actually uh, wanted to take over the winter solstice, a holiday, and take what was pagan and make it Christian. It was called Saturn... Hold on, we got stalled here. I don't know how we're going to pronounce this. Saturnalius? 
Yeah, something along those lines, yeah. Here, hold on, I got it here. Saturnalia. S-A-T-U-R-N-A-L-I-A. It was a great Roman festival in which people would go around singing. And that's where we get possibly the Christmas caroling from. Exactly. At least that's what your research said. That's what mine said. Mine's well, all about Yule, though. Like Yule all... Winter solstice with the Anglo-Saxons. You have the Yule Yuletide um, where they come together and they celebrate the winter solstice. And when the Catholic Church came through and they did assimilation, they took the easier way and, and made it easier for people to convert by bringing Christmas around that time and things like that. That's what I was always taught. So that's my preconceived notion. And then you have St. Nicholas, who was the precursor of Santa Claus, because mm -hmm. he would give gift to things. And he was a Turkish priest or monk who traveled around. So they kind of got some of the Santa Claus stuff from him. And then, well, then, of course, the favorite story, St. Boniface, who was being doing missionary work in Germany. And he saw the Odin or Thor tree that everyone was worshiping, the evergreen, and he chopped it down. Oh, so, yeah, he's like, oh, yeah, oh, your God's protecting that tree? Let me chop that bad boy down and take that. <laughs> all right, so continue on. So, I could do Boniface stories all day. Anyway, no, I mean, here's <laughs> the thing. How much have we just kind of said, yep, that's true? Oh, absolutely, all of it. Yeah. None of my research found any early church documents or writings that support any of that. <laughs> like, none of it. <laughs> wait, wait. Not one single thing. No, not, not one. Not a single early church father, not a single early church historian. There was not a single thing in early church history that supports any of these things that we have come to believe. But it, but it says in the oh that's right it says in the Bible in Jeremiah don't uh, work don't have any trees in your houses worship. But alas, all right, okay, so, all right. So what so what did you do, what did you find that was interesting? So I found this and this is a a, a very less uh, talked about obviously, and it might seem strange. But there's actually church historical documents that support this theory. Okay. So if you want to take, like, what theory do I believe? Am I going to believe the theory that has no early church documentation? Or am I going to take the theory that has some early church documentation? Now, when I say this, I'm not talking, like, biblical texts. Right. I'm talking things that maybe came in the first couple centuries type documentation. Okay. Right. That kind of thing after Christ. So uh, this is the theory that actually didn't really uh, get talked about much until, let me make sure I get his name right, French scholar Louis Duchesne. This was the early 20th century, okay. actually uh, started to develop this. And then there was an American named Thomas Talley, who he's the one who really kind of brought this to a whole thing uh, to be. And this goes all the way back to 200 uh 200, about the year 200, okay. uh, so right, not that far after Christ, no. um, in Tertullian of Carthage, oh. okay, he reported that the calculation of the 14th of Nisan, which was the day that Jesus was crucified according to the Gospel of John, okay. in the that's where Jesus died, was March 25th according to the Roman calendar, if we were trying to okay. overlap them, right? Because we know that Jesus, his resurrection reset the entire calendar. All right, so and Jesus' it, death was on March 25th. March 25th, right? Okay. So, But I'm just, little history, right? The Roman calendar was different. Yep, there's and the then, Julian, the Gregor, Gregorian, Gregorian calendar. And then okay. what happens is the resurrection, which I think is proof of the resurrection, was such a big world-changing event that our calendar system changed okay. <laughs> to center around this Jesus. Just for those out there that might wonder, is Jesus real? I think that's some pretty strong evidence. Anyways, um, so if we overlap the calendar, we find that on March 25th is when this would be, the, the crucifixion, right? Okay. What is nine months after March 25th? Nine months. Wait, hold on. April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. That would be nine months. That would be December 25th. And nine December months December 25th. So the belief was that Jesus was actually conceived and crucified on the same day of the year. No, get out. But think of the full circle of what Christmas really means. It's it's Christ 
God becoming flesh, dwelling among his people, that he may save his people, that he may uh, pay the ultimate sacrifice, that he would be the final atonement, that he would be the crucified lamb, that he would be the the sacrifice of all sacrifices, right? Mm -hmm. And so he comes makes himself flesh on the same day he would be crucified not same year but same day making it a whole full circle type of event that's wild i know like to kind of point to the fact like this is why i'm here like i would i came on this day and i left on this day to emphasize that he was there for the atonement mm -hmm. gotcha. so uh this idea appears in an anonymous christian treatise titled on solstices and equinoxes which appears to come from the 4th century North Africa. The treaty states, Therefore our Lord was conceived on the 8th of the Kalians of April in the month of March, which would be March 25th, okay. which is the day of the Passion of the Lord and of his conception. For on that day he was conceived on the same he suffered. Based on this, the treaty's dates, Jesus' birth, would have been the winter solstice. Augustine, he too was familiar with this association. Augustine, the early church father, the one that we all kind of talk about, Augustine's confessions, all of these things. In, in On the Trinity, which uh, was around 399 to 419, mm -hmm. he writes, For he, Jesus, is believed to have been conceived on the 25th of March. This is Augustine. I've never heard upon this in my which life. <laughs> this is I've I, never heard this in my life. Ne neither have I. Upon which day also he suffered. So the womb of the virgin in which he was conceived, where no one of mortars was begotten, corresponds to the new grave in which he was buried, wherein was never man laid, neither before him nor since. But he was born, according to tradition, upon December the twenty fifth. Okay, we're going to have to unpack all this. Let's go to a quick word from our sponsors. <laughs> Hi, this is Vinay. Christmas season is upon us. And this year, Christmas Eve falls on a Sunday. So we will be having one gathering at 4 p.m. This is going to be a great opportunity to invite friends and family and come celebrate Jesus with our traditional candlelight service. We'll see you then. All right, so now this is kind of blowing my mind. I've never heard of any of this stuff before. In my research, as I was anticipating our discussion here, I was planning on going down the rabbit trail of acknowledging that, yes, there were pagan roots to some of the Christian traditions that were kind of culturally appropriated by Christians to make things easier for people. Like They already understood something, and then they just merged this in with it, to which we just acknowledge, sure, they did that, but it doesn't diminish it that it's now a Christian holiday. You've just thrown this out here where, you know, I was about to say, yeah, December 25th. Eh, that's not really the day they just stole it. You've now just laid out, no, that's a legitimate day that actually probably has a lot more significance than we, we think it is. Um, you know, with some of these things, you know, the church history studying this stuff, I, how have we never heard of this before? <laughs> I think because a lot of times, and this is maybe a life lesson, we just take things at face value or what we're told and eh, yep, that's good. But do we press in to actually want to know more about it? And sometimes, especially with things that maybe deal with messing with our tradition, mm -hmm. we don't want to shake that. We don't want to make something seem like, Oh my goodness. What if that like ruins my view of what I've known? And so for me, I, I didn't even know what I was going to discover on this path, but it showed to me that there, there is, actual things that date to Christian historians and early Christians that have been there, that if we just do a little digging, we can see that there, there might be a deeper meaning to things than what we are first told. Like the pagan thing. I always thought it was just stolen Roman pagan holiday. Didn't think much of it, that we just took anything pagan and tried to make it more Christian. But then you see the earliest of church followers and, and fathers, let's call them, 
they had nothing to associate with the pagans and it was all about Jesus and it was all about God's greater work and what God was doing. And it, to me, the sense is they could care less about what the pagans were doing. They only cared about what God was doing. And that's where my mind was even like, wow, this is crazy to think the full circleness of God, his, the, the story of redemption, the, the reason why uh, he came and, and why Christmas is important. All of these things is just like, wow, that's really eye-opening. And it, it encourages me more to press into things and to ask more questions and maybe just take answers. Yeah, that's true. Cause, you know, because one thing we often joked about, those of us, for some of us in modern evangelical churches, I'll speak to myself in the churches I grew up in, we never really embraced the history of the church. Mm-hmm. You know, the old uh, um, Peanuts joke was, you know, church history. You know, you know, my pastor was born in 1956. That's when church history started, mm-hmm. where we've kind of jettisoned a lot of, you know, the creeds and the confessions and the more liturgical churches. I mean, even for me, as we're heading into now Advent season, growing up, I'd heard of Advent calendars, but I really have no concept even of what Advent is with those kind of things. So, I mean, yeah, we can look back and say, what do these, what do these early church fathers believe And we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Because as you know, when you reinvent the wheel, you rarely ever end up with something round. Yeah, (laughs) Mm -hmm. I mean, that is true. The the thing that I find uh, fascinating is, you know, I've kind of dipped my foot in different denominations in my faith journey. And one of those things is, you know, I I had a Lutheran background Mm -hmm. and then kind of came more into the Baptist evangelical Mm -hmm. world. And what I realized is things that were so important in the Lutheran background had very little importance in the evangelical Baptist type background. Any examples you can give? An example would be Christmas, right? So Christmas Eve, think of uh, Catholic traditions or Lutheran traditions and in some of these more traditional uh, church church bodies. Mm-hmm. Christmas Eve is like just as big if of Easter, if not Easter. There was a time that Back in college, my my friend would, uh, it was a pretty sweet gig for me. Um, His parents had a timeshare down in the Bahamas. Nice. And so he uh, would invite me on Christmas break to come join them down there. Uh, And, you know, I just had to get my airfare. It was a pretty pretty good gig for a college student especially. And I remember one time coming home and being so excited that I could get home and in time for a Christmas Eve service. But the church I went to didn't have a Christmas Eve service at the time. Uh, it, I got in too late. My flight got in. But I found one that was like at 11 o'clock at night at this traditional church. And it was like, I just went and I was like, I got to be there because it's Christmas Eve. Not many evangelicals would be like, I got to change everything just to be at Christmas Eve service and hold that candle and sing Oh Holy Night. Like, Yeah, we would not do that. Exactly, right? So then... I get even here to fellowship and I was like, all right, so Christmas Eve, right? That's going to be a big event. It's a big thing. And people looked at me like, "Uh, it's kind of like, is it really? Is it really? (laughs) And I was like, oh, those are like two completely different worlds, right? At that moment, Robert went, I think I've made a mistake. (laughs) No, no, no. no. It's just one of those things like, oh, wow. Like there is that understanding that things like that aren't that big of a deal sometimes. So like uh, Advent, for instance, is one of those things that... Yeah, I have no concept of. We do the candles and I, I've he's as a host, I've gone up there and done it, mm-hmm. done that. I, I still, I'm just like, hey, what? I have to Google it. Like, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Yeah. And, and actually Advent, it's impossible to determine the start of Advent. So what's interesting is like, if we take Easter, Easter's in all four gospels. Easter is the, the, the central part of our Christian faith. Mm-hmm. Like if there's if, if there is no death and resurrection of Jesus, there is no Christianity. Right. Right? Our faith is useless. Even Paul would say that. And so we can all rally around Easter because we know that is with the Passover, Jesus was the Passover lamb, those kind of things, even lent the anticipation and mm-hmm. and kind of uh, lament of our as we go into that season of why Christ had to die for our sins, we can all rally around that. But Christmas is like we kind of all have our own views of it. Right. It's only in two of the four gospel accounts. Honestly, if we're to be honest, it all didn't even happen on the same day. Like those nativity scenes with the shepherd and the wise men and baby Jesus, like they probably weren't all there 
Right. You probably have to put your wise men like in the upstairs bedroom furthest away. Yeah, like they were on their way, but they didn't exactly get there right that that day. And so I think like there's a lot to that that we've dramatized or commercialized or kind of made into what we think it is. But even biblically, it's it's not there to support it. And so I think because Christmas, I hate to say it, isn't as big of a deal. Mm-hmm. It right, it's a big deal, but not as big of a deal as the resurrection. Right. Uh, we have all these different ways we approach it. But coming back to Advent, uh, Advent is really simply just the anticipation of the coming of Jesus. And so it's just a build up to anticipating his coming. And and what I love about Christmas and what I find we all might enjoy the most about Christmas, whether we're believers or Mm non-believers, it's tradition. And that's why you see the different feuds or the different takes on how to go about Christmas and how to celebrate Christmas, because really we're all defending our traditions that we're trying to keep. I've also seen recently that there's a lot of, I lose track of what the generation names are. Mm -hmm. Younger generations now, especially of men who are actually looking for more of that traditional liturgical they want that structure of the old church to kind of almost give a, a meaning to their life that's been lost by sometimes the watering down of it or the lack of focus on it. Mm-hmm. So I'd be curious to see, you know, churches go through trends and everything. I'll be curious to see what the modern church looks like in, say, five to ten years if we do f- more fully embrace some of those old traditions of how we do things more. Yeah, you think like a traditional church has a uh, eternal candle uh, always going. So if, if you're in most traditional churches, they're going to have a candle that's always lit. Uh, and, and that's the Christ candle. And even in the Advent wreath, the center candle is the representing the Christ candle. And when, you, when you're when you singing O Holy Night or whatever song and you're holding those candles, it's lit from that Christ candle, spreading the light. And I think there's a lot of things that the church has celebrated throughout history with or without technology that brings us back to our forefathers and to the early church believers And I think that's what we love about Christmas. I think of the family Christmas traditions we had and how many of those I try to carry on to my kids and into my family and to keep passing that on generation after generation. And in the church, sometimes we just kind of say, oh, we're going to do this, but we forget all the things that have happened before. And those liturgical, more traditional things actually unite us back to the early Christians and the saints, those believers who have come before us. Very cool. I like that. All right, let's take another break to hear another word from one of our sponsors. Hey, it's Sarah. One of our favorite traditions at Fellowship during the holiday season is going to the Macomb County Jail to pack bags for the inmates there. We will be doing this again this Christmas season on December 18th at 6 p.m. Please make sure you sign up online so we have enough pizza. See you there. All right, we're back. All right, now we're going to play a brand new game that I like to call Three Questions. Why will I ask three people one question or one person three questions, or most likely I will just ask all of you the questions. And so you're going to answer them. I'm going to answer them as well, so I will participate in this. Perfect. Normally I try to avoid that, but I will do it this time. All right, today. so here we go. Question number one. What is your favorite Christmas family tradition, either from growing up or that you do now? My favorite Christmas tradition is actually putting up the tree and putting the ornaments on it. Because I feel all the different things that you can do, that's like the time that it officially feels like it is Christmas season. Very good. And now, now we might divide the church over this. When do you put your Christmas tree up? <sighs> so it used... Because this is, this, is, this is turned into one of those things. That's a thing. So now this is where maybe I've gone away from tradition. My family tradition growing up was always after Thanksgiving. Okay. And we kept that for a while, but now it's November 15th. Oh, why the 15th? Because it feels like you're halfway through November. But if we're hosting Thanksgiving, we might put it after Thanksgiving, so it still feels like Thanksgiving. But if we're not hosting Thanksgiving, we want the Christmas stuff up. Plus this year, like the outside lights, it was way easier to put them up when it was warmer out. Sure. But then if I put my lights up, why am I not going to turn them on? Like, so, you know, those kind of things. Very good. All right, Michael, so, you're up. I was a little bad. My my favorite tradition, first off, is putting up the tree as well. 
we had a whole charade around it. We'd make hot cocoa. When we got older, it was Hummers. We put uh, candy canes on the tree. Like it was a whole like escapade. But getting back to when to put the Christmas tree up. Oh, first time look. owning a home. And I will proudly say that I had my Christmas tree up before Thanksgiving. Because I feel like when I was a kid, Thanksgiving, like you'd have snow on the ground already. Like, and it would just feel that like wintry. It was like the first cusp into, hey, I'm getting the JCPenney catalog and I'm going to be going through. Do you guys remember those catalogs? When you actually went Black Friday shopping on Black Friday. Right. And so, like, and you got up early right. in the morning and you rushed right. to the store. Or when, like, the. They really change things, and all of a sudden, now Thanksgiving night, the store's open. And so yes. you ate your meal, you went through the catalogs, and then at night you went. And then and you, you go to that store with the red circles. And yeah. You're like, oh, look, cheap movies. Well, yes. And the- now you just get on your phone. Oh, Black Friday shopping. Well, like, Cyber Monday slash Black Friday slash. The, like, Christmas coming of age thing for me was, like, when I was old enough to go out Black Friday shopping with all my cousins. I remember the first time we did it, we were up north doing Thanksgiving at my uncle's cabin. And we ended up going to, uh, I think it was Big Rapids. We went to Big Rapids, and then we went through all the stores. Because as a kid, you hear about the chaos at Walmart. and Oh, my gosh. And you're running around because you have no idea really right. what you're doing. But you're old enough to stay out all night long. So it was like a big coming of age. You know what I mean? Very good. Awesome. All right. So now for me growing up, I had a small family. What we would do is every Christmas Eve, we'd go to my grandparents' house. We come in, and then my uncle and his kids, they come in, and we'd all be together on Christmas Eve. And then you go home, you do Christmas morning, and then we'd all come back Christmas afternoon. So it's like you could show what you got to your friends, your cousins. And then my cousin, uh, my, you know, we were the only two boys, he came over to our place on Christmas night. We'd spend the night, and then we'd go out on Boxing Day, which is the fun day after Christmas, British holiday, where you go and you like return the stuff you didn't want, but it's also all the stuff on sale. Mm-hmm. And my mother and grandmother loved it because all the Christmas wrapping was super, super cheap. And this was back in the day before Walmart was in town. So you'd be going to like Hudson's at the old Eastland mm-hmm. Mall and then Lakeside when it was still a thing. So that was one of our fun traditions as a kid. All right, here we go. Question number two. What is your favorite Christmas movie? Oh, I, I'm a total Home Alone fan. Ah! So any of the Home Alones, I will actually just like, I just... Yeah, they're fantastic. All right, very good. All right, Michael. I'm torn. So leading into Christmas, I know it's not a Christmas movie, but Harry Potter. I don't know why. You're a wizard, Harry. But it's always on TV. When I was a kid, I'd always watch it. I think Harry Potter is a Christmas movie the same way Die Hard and Batman Returns are Christmas movies. Die Hard is a Christmas movie, 100%. Anyways, now for Christmas Day... It's the Christmas story because they used to run the marathon of it. Oh, yeah. My dad would always sit down and be like, this is exactly what it was like when I was a kid. <laughs> Man, it must have been rough. With that you know? BB gun? <laughs> yeah. You'll shoot your eye out, kid. Hey, imagine having your family from Ohio. The yeah. movie takes place in Ohio. You really got, this is how it was as a kid. <laughs> we, we had bought the the movie of, was it, what's it called? Christmas, the Christmas movie? Christmas story. Because you always see Christmas, it, Christmas story. story. It's always on loop. And you know, I guess there's some coarse language in it every now and again, which you never hear because it's always on TV. So we got the movie, we put it in to play it. And this is when my son was little. We're having it, and we're starting hearing just these little words that pop up. And we're like, oh. Uh. So once again, that's just one of those movies that you watch it on TV as a kid and think it's good. And then you get the movie and you watch it and you realize, oh, mistakes might have been made here. <laughs> All right, now, so, you, so you're going with Christmas. My favorite Christmas movie. Now, I, I will give the honorary mention to Elf. Because that is my wife's absolute favorite. 10 a.m. Santa's coming to town. Santa! Oh my God! Santa here? I know him. It's Santa. I know him. Um, <laughs> you have the world's I'm best kidding. coffee. Congratulations. <laughs> Do you know during that scene they just said Will Ferrell go out and just Will Ferrell it up, and that's what he did. That's you all s- improv. You sit on a throne of lies. <laughs> But no, my favorite Christmas movie is Bill Murray's Scrooge. Oh, great. Oh, yeah. It's Christmas Eve. It's it's the one night of the year when we all act a little nicer. We 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 smile a little easier. We 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 share a little more. 
great it, movie. It's completely underrated. It's been lost. I think Elf kind of replaced it as like the funny Christmas movie. With Tiny Tim. And, oh, yeah. it's fa la 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 Bill Murray is a gem. I will say it, that. It, that is fine. All right. All right. So third question. This is our final one. What is What was your favorite or most memorable toy that you received as a child? <laughs> so uh, I don't know why this comes up. But there was like, so my kids, they just don't understand the world without technology the way we have it. And this was like a big technological advancement. It was electronic football where you had these little football players oh. and the board vibrated. The and the one? Yeah, yeah, and they like moved up and down the field and you tried to put them on and then you started it up and if they made it. Yeah, that, that's like, I don't know why, but when I think of Christmas gifts, and maybe I didn't even get it for Christmas. I feel, because my birthday's like right around Thanksgiving and Christmas, but somewhere in that window, yeah. I got this like electrical football thing, and I, I'll never forget it. Nice. All right, Mike, what do you got? Um, So I would say Batman. When I was a kid. Never I, the wrong answer. Never the wrong answer. I was a huge Batman. I mean, the original like uh, TV series, Batman. Mm -hmm. um, now, wait, hold on. When you say original TV series, are you talking about Batman the animated series or the 1966 Batman Adam Way West no, kind of game? Adam animated and Batman Beyond. I was a okay. big Batman Beyond fan. Because we're different original Batman eras. Yes, yeah, my, for my era. Um, and I got the Batmobile. I think it was from the one with Mr. Freeze, but you could attach the wings to it. Ooh. You could pull it off. You could make it into a boat. And that came into plenty of bath times with me um, and the wheels on the front. And then it also came with the back cave. And that was probably like the coolest present I think I ever got as a, as a kid. Like that was the most impactful one for me, I think. Very cool. I still have that actually. That's up in the attic. Wait for my kids. So nice. Nice. When I was younger, the one that I got that I loved and there's a lot of time, your know, parents are always generous with this. I got the Millennium Falcon mm. from the Star Wars. And you get, and it came like, I always love the little guys through the story. And it came with like the little pig guy and some of the other guys. So that was my favorite. So that was what, 1983, maybe? 84? Michael, how old were you in 1984? Um, I was still a twinkle in my dad's eye. <laughs> <laughs> 90s baby <laughs> very good all right well robert before we close any final thoughts on christmas for for our listeners you know i just hope you all have a blessed christmas i think and uh just pray that you know you have time with family that it's a unifying time for families it's not a divisive time for families uh that there's sweet memories in it i, I would pray though that you if you're not attached to a church somewhere that you find a church to celebrate at the reason that we have everything the reason that we have gifts the reason that we have means even a dollar in our pocket is because our good God has given us everything. Everything we have, even the breath we have is from him. And so I'd encourage you just to take this time and just be grateful for, for our creator and also to be grateful for the fact that he came, that the word became flesh and that it dwelt among us. I mean, that is, that's amazing. The king of the universe, the creator of all things visible and invisible came to us. Very good. That's pretty powerful. All right. Well, that was another episode of the For You podcast. If you'd like the content that you saw here today, please give us a like and subscribe. And if you have any ideas for any future topics or guests, please leave a note in the comment section below. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.